So I'm here to tell you about CK12. As Jason said, CK12 is a nonprofit with a mission to help improve education by giving access to kids and by providing STEM subjects for middle school and high school students. And why do we do this? Let me show you. Let me share with you why we do this. So David Wiley from Utah was tired of textbooks. They thought, he thought they were expensive. They lack the ability to be customized. You kind of got a package and you gave, handed one kid a textbook every time you got started the school year. So he came to CK12, and let me show you what he did with CK12. So one of the things when he came in to do was he was going to make a biology book. And he saw, saw that we had mathematics, and we had a lot of uh, uh, science subjects. And he went in and he picked out the biology book from our flex books. Now we call these flex books. When we started about seven years ago, our first generation was a flex book. Flex book is nothing but a flexible, customizable textbook. And I'm going to just want to give you a flavor of what a textbook looks like. It has exactly the same kind of content that a textbook would have. Our challenge was when we started people were not used to textbooks being on the web, or if they were on the web, they were just PDFs. Again, you couldn't customize them. So we built a system so that you could actually start customizing all this content for your own context. Our next generation, in our next generation, what we did was we took, we asked the question, what is it that students really need to learn? And we decomposed the textbook into concept-based learnings. So each of these subjects was broken down into smaller bits of concepts. So the concept basically form the basis of your learning, the high on which you can actually build deeper learning. So once we did that, we found there were about 5,000 concepts that one has to learn to kind of finish middle school and high school level content and, you know, and to really take off your learning. So what did David do? He said, OK, how do I go ahead and create a book out of that? So we started pulling out things. So let me show you what a concept looks like. So let's talk about mollusks. I always have trouble pronouncing the, the, this word, mollusks. Now, why am I showing you this? I want to show you this because I think they're really cute. Okay, I mean, they're strange creatures. Why would anyone want to learn about this? I mean, first of all, the student's going to be asking this question, why do I got to do this? So one thing we did was we said, okay, we'll give you this, the idea why you got to do this by putting everything together in a container. Textbook is a container. A concept is a container. So what we did was took this concept and let's, say, let's en enrich them with all kind of things that you can now do on digital media. So that means if you go to the first one, which is a mollusk, the reading, it's, it's exactly pretty much the same as a textbook. It gives you a smaller amount of content. You start with a question, which kind of draws the student in. So once you start that, you kind of talk about uh, the concept itself. We've given you the text. We've given you uh, illustrations. We've given, given you. Everything you would need to teach, you can use it as is, or you can contain your own versions. We've given you links from outside the web, so you can have much deeper uh, you know, access. But you know what else we did? We actually partnered or even created our own videos. So I'd like you to share with you this video from KQED, who we partnered with them. It's a pretty cute video that kind of shows you what a Cuttlefishes. <laughs> I mean, it would attract. I mean, when you see that, a student will be attracted. I mean, they'll want to know what, what is this creature? Right? What are the things around this creature? Now, and, 
all these creatures. I mean, all of a sudden we have in front of us this whole new world in context. It's not that you know you kind of have a video somewhere that you go watch. But we've created this environment where you can actually learn in one place and kind of not be lost. Imagine the frustration when you had to learn when you were you know, just reading something and you, then you had to go to the lab and you had to wait till your lab was a week later. The moment of learning was lost. The power of this system is that it allows you to learn in the moment. And I'm getting ahead of myself, but you know, we can pull great stuff from other places that is you know, very, very instrumental in people's learning. You never know what's going to help you learn. So in, a, in addition to providing all the resources, we've actually also given you summaries so that you, know, you can remember these things. I mean, students still have to pass exams, right? We've also given you some practice capability. We've given you re review questions. We've also given you vocabulary. It's important with students. Now, remember there are many students who don't know English. The system can actually then give you a different language. So in the context, in the moment, you can actually get, if you don't understand, it's not that students aren't behind and they, they don't are stupid or don't understand. It's just that they don't know how to relate to, the, to different languages. So let's go to the next modality. And you might ask me, what is a modality? Modality is really just a, any way for you to learn. It's another way for you to learn. So now we can actually pull in other great stuff. I mean, David Gallo is well known for his stuff from Woods Hall. So these are very, very, um, you know, um, contextualized as well as uh, authentic stuff. It's not just, you know, pulled in randomly. So we have quality assured, quality control this stuff. So students actually can start taking part in this work. They can start collecting critical questions that that can then become discussion questions in the classroom. In addition, students love to create. We have interns coming in every year. They love to create flashcards, or they love to create uh, study guides. So let me share one study guide with you. Now, we have students' voice, students taking, taking part in their own education. So not only are they creating it for themselves, this kind of uh, you know, content, but they're also creating it for their peers. And peer-to-peer -peer help is, is, we know more and more, not only just literature, we know for a fact that it's the peer influence that really helps in um, students' learning. Assessment. With every unit, we've kind of built an assessment. At the ve this is the first generation of us as assessment. So the Mollusk group in which the I resembles a vertebra vertebrae I is. Does anyone know the answer? Hold on. Anyone know the answer to this one? OK, there you go. Let's see. Oh, wow, you're right. Yeah, give him a. OK. Anyone know this one? The scientific study of mollusks is known as? Moscology. OK, let's try that. Whoops. <laughs> so anyway, you get the idea. So this, these are practice questions. And, and you know the, the idea around these modalities is all about being engrossed, being immersed. So when you're immersed in one media verse, you know, then the next and next and next, what are we doing? We're actually practicing, but in different ways, and it's not boring anymore. And so not only have we done that, we've actually created tools so that now you can actually take the embed code and put it in some, some other website. Anything that you see on our website, you can use, remix, customize, do whatever you want to do except for commercialize. We actually give you the ability to create workbooks, which is worksheets, test sheets. I mean, next generation of this is coming out in the next month, which will allow you to create 
tests from anywhere in our, in our system from, you know, if you're doing, teaching different concepts at different times, you can pull in a test or you can test a particular concept. Um, you know, you can create homework. So there's lots of stuff that you can do with the content, content that we provide. Now, my best, my most favorite is the next modality. Because real world application is what helps students to really relate the concept that they're learning to how it applies to, middle world, to the real world. So these are created by teachers that you're seeing. But in general, we are encouraging more and more students to take part in creating these examples. So let's see uh, hiding in plain sight. Again, it's a video. Video is a great way. Uh, images, videos are great ways for us to kind of in, uh, encourage students to get uh, involved. So where did, so let's play this video. And I, I want to show you how you might, this is from Monterey Bay. Um, uh, I forget the whole, Ambury, Monterey Bay Aquarium Research, Research Institute. Institute. Thank you. And so there's lots of great content that we've contextualized and put it together in one container so that it makes sense. So students and teachers don't have to go out and start looking for it and waste time in trying to do this. Um, in addition to that, we give you know everything that we can to make it a deeper and richer experience. We actually have three levels of this content, and at the grade level, below grade, if somebody is not there, we call it basic or advanced content, so that we can take care of different students in different ways. And so, this is one way. This is a really powerful way, and I philosophically believe that if we give students ways, different ways to learn, rather than one size fits all we will make a difference. We are also embarking upon, upon simulations or interactive, uh, interactive connection, interact, in, interact, interactive with your own learning. So what we do is we provide, this is again a very early one, and it's a physics one I, we don't have. We couldn't make one up for mollusks, but maybe in the future. But li literally, this is about um, distance and velocity. And, and so the whole idea is it's a little bit fun, it's a little bit in the context, and kind of attracting students to do this, to figure out what distance and what velocity needs to happen to uh, create that. <laughs> um, not only is it's not just a play tool, actually, but we actually give you the basics, the scientific and the mathematical reasoning behind all this stuff, and so we put uh, you know, graphing tools or whatever the in, in interaction involves, that tool for it to make, may make, make meaning for you. So that, in a nutshell, is some of the features. Where are we today? We judge, we're probably in, the, in, in about 4,000 schools in the U.S., 3,500 districts. We are used by community colleges. We are being used by alternative uh, education, <laughs> homeschooling, charter schools. But we have, this year alone, over 2 million students and teachers on our website. And I think part of that reason is because now many more schools and teachers have access to computers that we are able to kind of finally have that kind of volume. But in, in general, we have over 40 million usage of our content only on our website. Our device numbers are different. Uh, we believe that you should have access to ev everything we have in any which way you can. So somebody in, um, in Nepal actually has created our content, downloaded it off uh, offline, and made it available for um, children who don't have access, who are in the, uh, you know, in, in um, What's the word in uh, orphan orphanages? So they have access to this content. In the U.S., uh, Palo Alto School District has access to our content. So anybody can ha have access to it in any way they can access it, and that is part of our philosophy. So what we learned, we've learned in the student perspective. Really, they only want small bits of information. They don't care for the bigger end. Just give me something that'll hold my attention for two minutes. 
So we give them that kind of uh, access. They want to learn in the moment. They don't want to have to wait because curiosity is such a thing that if you don't feed it, it goes away. So we give that uh, capability. Teachers, teachers also have to have their own you know, things for them, them to learn. And finally, um, teachers also want to know what students are doing. So what's, what, what are we doing towards that? We're actually now starting to give assessment and guidance. So our next generation that's coming out very soon has assessment as well as guidance. We're building all the data structure around that and the rules to capture the learning. Again, we are building up much more simulations. And, and finally, we are also doing peer support so that students can talk to each other. And it's a you know, very, very strong component of learning. And we are very cognizant of that. I know Daphne talked about it earlier, peer-to-peer -peer social learning. And we believe in that, too. So we've been building that peer-to-peer -peer support system. What happened to David and Utah? Well, the $150 textbook now cost him $4.60. It's been tested last two years. It's been tested in the school, schools in uh, Utah. And we found that actually the learning outcomes didn't change from if they were using a publisher's textbook. So in very early stages, even our, our content is as good as publishers. <laughs> Sorry. I said, I said it's not good for him. <laughs> well, you got to win some and lose some, right? <laughs> That's true. But anyways, I, you know, I, I think we, we all have a place in this ecosystem. There's all kind of choices we all have to do, make, and make available. So uh, finally, what we need is we need people to get involved in this effort because we need to make a difference. Too many kids are being wasted. Um, and team at ck12.org, please get a hold of us. So some thoughts from our uh, panel on uh, Nuru's open source textbooks. Esther, you're a teacher, right? So yeah. What do you think? So I think the textbooks are terrific. and. Um, in all subject areas. I think the biggest block that there is out there is that school districts somehow are afraid to switch. Yep. And, uh, and so I don't, in the state of California, they have a, um, a special pot of money for paying teachers and another pot of money for textbooks and another pot of money for building and so forth. They're all in little pots. And uh, so if you don't spend your textbook allotment from one year to the next, you lose it. Yep. So uh, school districts are afraid to um, not spend it. Yep. So that's one of the one of the problems. So if we can change that, and if we can uh, give t school districts the opportunity to actually have the money and spend it in the way that they think is most appropriate, uh, like for digital devices, for example, or for books yep. like this or yep. whatever. Um, it would make a huge difference. And uh, so I think that that's, yeah. that's one of the problems that needs to be addressed. It's on a policy level. No, I completely agree with you. And that actually was a huge hurdle for us, you know, to go through this. What will we do if we take your content? We can't even print it because each teacher has about $200 per year or something ridiculous like that right. to spend on, you know, stuff like this. But there's a whole change that's happening that uh, the policy level is changing. Even California is actually now changing towards uh, you know, making digital as part of uh, your things you can your buy. textbook allotment? Yep. So that would be great. Yep, it's happening. It's happening. Michael, yep. what are your thoughts? I mean, you obviously from a textbook company, so. <laughs> yeah, and as, as I mentioned, we're not just a textbook company. We, did get the, <laughs> <laughs> we got the memo before this presentation. Yeah. Um, and, and, and maybe to that point, I think, um, the, the, the right, the, the trends are very much in that direction and, and the, the pace of legislation change, of course, and how materials are procured with public money of, is its own beast, right? It's its own process. Right. Uh, what we really see, though, is that there are, 
Um, it, it's, it's really, to us, it's about shifting the value proposition from the, what we would call the input cost, which might be the cost of a textbook or a digital equivalent, um, towards the, the, the output and the results, right? right. And yeah. then only then can you start to get into effectiveness or even maybe more traditional ROI kinds of measures. So, so really, we, we've already made that shift, yeah. at least if I were to just speak for, yeah. for Pearson as a, as a stakeholder in this, in this, um, this large ecosystem. Uh, I, I think that, you know, another dimension of this that's really important too is how does the how does the feedback loop of, of digital actually get employed? So, so when you think about the engagement metrics that you show there, and then you, I, I noticed it was quite noticeable that the assessment was a different tab, for example, and 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 so that to me reflects a bit of a conventional paradigm. You you could, if you looked at what happens actually in the gaming world today. Uh, assessments actually embedded in the experience and has been for a very long yeah. time. You in never video have games. a separate yeah. in, video in video games, games. correct? Yeah. That's right. So, so what, some what, some might call that embedded formative or, or other kinds of terms, right? So that's really I, I think where where some of this lends to, right? It moves towards some ability to to interpret and understand from the behavior what you're actually picking up, what you're learning, and then the unexplored area it gets to be the exciting things around social. And, and you can take a cooperative angle, you can take a competitive angle, you can do some version of are you smarter than a six-year-old or your six-year-old brother, right? That they're, they're, to me, there are fairly untapped areas in the learning domain that can happen, um, hopefully, both um, outside the traditional classroom context, which we think about, as well as within the traditional, right, which has its own, if you will, boundaries. Is, is Pearson expanding their thinking to be even more consumer as this trend becomes bottom-up? Yeah, uh, it, very much so. I mean, the, the term we use internally is really there, there's some kind of consumerization of education that's happening. Um, again, within the constraints of the way the industry runs. So you, you could say the same for healthcare, yeah. right? And so, so right, there, there are a lot of analogies we talk about where uh, the information about how the learner is doing is really for that learner, right? Not, not mm -hmm. unlike personal health records, right? And we also have seen um, good ideas or consumer-driven ideas there don't actually get the same traction that, that we see in other domains. So, so I think that's, that's where we put a little bit of pause there. Um, but definitely the, the forcing functions and the, also the expectations of the learners, I think, is maybe the most critical aspect, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the 4 million kids per year that are born in the United States alone, right, entering uh, preschool and then on their way to traditional school, right, what's normal for them is a little bit different than what's normal for us here in the audience. Right, so, so for many of them, they were born and there was never such a thing as no smartphones, right? There was never sure. such a thing as no iPhone 5S, right? Take one so. more um, piece of feedback and then... Yeah, uh, actually just a quick question. I love the fact that you're dropping in media made by other people and you mentioned kids. Can you talk, just, just describe briefly, you know, how much media are you getting in from kids, from teachers? I mean, how much does this become really a, almost a, a public uh, sort of tapestry of, of things? Um, so let me give you an example. Uh, last, this past school year, we actually did a competition called Get Real Competition. You're aware of that. And um, the idea in this competition was we wanted students to create real world example and we wanted them to use real, the new tools. So if you think about the makers movement, which is about hand tools with the Intel Science Fair, right, which is your uh, science and math kind of uh, fair. We wanted to create a forum for them, for students to start using uh, these new world tools which are made possible by the computers, the digital tools, and take them to start creating their own outputs. And you know, the first time, it was very small competition. We wanted to see how much we really got. So we, we got over 100, 110 uh, entries, which was amazing because these kids were clamoring to be How many part of those of it. wind up getting published? All of them. All oh, of them will be published. They're all of significant quality to Very be published. Very great power. Okay. Well, the first prize actually went to uh, leadership public schools right from here. One, and then second prize went to uh, Colorado Springs and Alaska. So we were getting... But one thing I want to talk about, I just mentioned, uh, I forgot to say, about consumerism. Uh, as Daphne earlier in her talk said, we want to have access. We want to make sure that students have access to learning material. So everything we provide is for free. I don't know whether I mentioned that, but I want to make sure that I did yeah. mention that. 
Okay, it's, so it's, it is free. <laughs> yes, and, and you can use it any way you want. Any way you want. Except you can't resell it. You cannot resell. You can come to us and ask us for, for permission. We do have like Amplify. They came and said, "Hey, can we?" Yeah. And so we can we can come to some. Right. Let's hear it for CK12. <laughs> well and next up is Crowdmark. <laughs> 